lovelies. My name is Joanna. I am a needlework designer and I design under the label Mojo Stitches. Um, I wanted to do a floss tube about four or five years ago and I chickened out. So <laughs> I hope you don't mind me arriving somewhat late to the party. <laughs> um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you who have um, said a nice thing on Instagram or bought one of my charts or stitched one of my charts. I am, I am truly overwhelmed. Um, thank you. <laughs> it, is, it is a tremendous joy for me to think that I can bring some little contribution to your creativity. And it inspires me enormously to see how you take my patterns and run with them. And just to see your, your work in general, it's, it's just been a tremendous joy. So thank you very much. <sighs> Today is the day before Expo. <laughs> um, Needlework Expo, if you don't know, is an enormous uh, trade show in, in the uh, cross-stitch industry. And whew, <laughs> I, am, I am busy getting ready to go. And I thought... Well, I have some lovely things to show and, you know, photos don't always do them justice. I don't know whether my camera is going to do them justice either, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, I may not get through all my new releases in this video. This is literally my first go. We will see how long the camera battery lasts. Um, but I will introduce you to, to at least some of them and there'll be, you know, more videos to come. But yes, Expo, tomorrow. And because, if you, if you can tell from my accent, I'm Australian. Expo's in the US. So, so it starts at 1am in the morning for me. So I'm going to have three nights <laughs> starting at 1am. So I'm basically nocturnal at the moment. It's like 9 o'clock in the morning, but it feels about half past seven at night to me because I've been trying to acclimatise. So... If I babble particularly incoherently, blame sleep dep deprivation and a little bit of nerves. Anyway, bear with me. I have some things to show you. I don't know if you've seen, if you follow me on Instagram, just at Mojo Stitches or my shop on Etsy. Same name. <laughs> um, thank you, first of all. <laughs> I have some new releases coming out for Expo that I'm really so excited about. Um and particularly excited because I was able to announce that I have, um, I was asked to do a collaboration with Cottage Garden Threads on a range of special threads designed specifically for cross stitch. They're great for embroidery of all kinds, but we, we concentrated on making them particularly friendly for cross stitch. And I can't tell you what an honour that was. Um, and <laughs> Katie rang me up. I literally burst into tears. It was, it was really embarrassing. But anyway, um, so we've been we've been working on this for some time. Um, I literally got the last final <laughs> final threads about a week ago. Had to finish some stitching. <laughs> so um, it's it's been a crazy sort of week and a half getting it all finalised and, and and getting everybody to see them. I, they have turned out even more beautiful than I expected and I would just love to sort of introduce you to them and tell you the kind of the story behind them because stories mean a lot to me so I'm hoping this might, um, might interest you. Anyway, um, Cottage Garden Threads, if you don't know, are a wonderful um, Australian... Um, company that hand dyes embroidery and cross stitch threads, and I've been work I've been using their threads for quite some time, and just really been um, amazed by everyone's interest. They they are an absolute joy to work with. <laughs> they make beautiful colours, and um, they bring something different that I think we haven't seen before, and allow some different things that we can do with our stitching. So for me, it's been very inspiring for my creativity and um, I hope they will be for you as well. So when Katie came to me, um, the Cottage Garden Threads are a mother-daughter team, Katie and Katie and her mum Pam and a team of absolutely wonderful people and uh, we were sort of tossing around ideas and of the theme 
for the line and the the first one that came to me and if if you knew me you'd, you'd see that this was kind of obvious but it means a lot to me i thought of the beautiful warm rich colors of old books i am an enormous reader i <laughs> these kind of beautiful things. You know when you get a pile of old books and those colours that are kind of dual tones and warm but a little bit, little bit uh, loved. So that was kind of my inspiration and um, that's been so much fun to put it together. Um, I worked in bookstores for years. I studied at university for longer than several eons of the earth. Um, <laughs> I worked as an editor, I worked in publishing, so books have always been part of my life. And to be able to kind of combine books and stitching has just been such a joy. Anyway, um, let me show you the threads. <laughs> I will put up, if I can work out how to do it, some beautiful photos um, where they're all staged and beautiful and look pretty, but I thought I would just show them one by one. I, I'm hoping you were going to be able to see them really well through this, but do check out the photos as well because you know what it's like, monitors, they all look different. This is number one. This is called, yes, forgetting. The line is called Bookshelf. Um, I always liked designs and things that have a sense of place. So I was thinking of creating one of those beautiful old libraries or secondhand bookstores or a reading nook where you're surrounded by the things that make you feel comfortable and um, those kind of places have always been my happy places so that was that was my idea behind the um, the thread line and you know what Katie and Pam and t the team have done to bring that to life has just been beyond expectations anyway back <laughs> This is number one. This is um, called Pocketful. Um, Katie named this one, which I thought was so perfect. I thought of the colours of dried rose petals, you know, of, of a lovely little bunch that someone gave you years ago and you still got dried up in a corner because it's a beautiful memory. So it's, it's full of um, beautiful roses, um, rose colours and pinks with a little bit of old gold, like the crispy edges of a, of a dried petal. I am so excited to be playing with this one it turned out even more beautiful than I expected and I am I'm thrilled so oh the name kind of like pocket full of posies I think that's where it came from so it's it's beautiful the second we called um leather bound um I was thinking of all those beautiful old books that have a lovely dark red tinge to them you know, something like this that's got that lovely bit of age and wear that's kind of got, it's a soft red. It's like very deep in colour, but soft as well. I love, I just love the the tones that you get in, the, in things that have a bit of love and age to them. So that's what I was thinking with that. It's a really beautiful, um, soft, warm red that is, I think, going to be my now favourite red. <laughs> Um, number three is called Bronte because if I'm thinking about, you know, what makes me comfortable, what makes me feel happy, you've got to have the Brontes on your shelf. Now, come on. <laughs> I, um, I have such memories of reading the Brontes when I was young. I remember reading Jane Eyre, Stuck in the Red Room, um, <laughs> when I was about 12 and just being overwhelmed by... The, the richness of the language and the, the, the beauty of the stories. Um, so, yeah, I, I this colour is a kind of... I was thinking of the colours of like a pomegranate. So a kind of soft red with pinkish undertones and I think it's turned out beautifully. This one is um, an almost solid. It's got a very slight variegation. As you'll see through this, we've sort of combined... Uh, threads that are almost solid, others that are a tone-on-tone -tone variegation and others like Pocketful that are, have more variegation in them. So they work well together. Um, and that was done 
deliberately because if you if you use too many of the really heavy variegations together in cross stitch it can make your motif kind of hard to read so if you combine them with ones that are a little more solid um, it helps you get the benefits of the variegation but it makes it um, easier to read so that's a little pro tip for you anyway I had to include the Brontes I could I could wax lyrical about the Brontes for quite some time I did English lit at uni I've read more books than humanly possible <laughs> I could go into that I just want to show you one thing though speaking of old books I got a pile over here so one of my treasures is an old copy of Follette, which is one of the novels by Charlotte Bronte, not the famous one, not Jane Eyre, but this is um, a very old copy, one of, my, one of my treasures. It doesn't have a date on it, unfortunately, but again, it's got those beautiful reds that I was thinking of. And it's actually such an old copy that it's got her pseudonym on it, because if you didn't know, the, the Bronte sisters who had a very difficult life and um, they're fascinating and I could ramble about them for ages if anyone's remotely interested. Um, they published under male pseudonyms at first because when they were writing, um, it was not considered seemly for women to write and particularly Emily's novel, Wuthering Heights, um, the publishers, from what I remember, believed it would be extremely scandalous if it came out that a woman wrote that. Um, it did come out eventually, of course, but this one still has the um, the pseudonym on it, and I, I think that's amazing. So it's, it's a treasure. <laughs> anyway, number four, speaking of happiness and places where you feel comfortable, this one's called Fireplace. And this is another one of the beautifully variegated ones that captures the browns and reds and golds of a lovely crackling fire. So I'm really excited to be using that for borders and writing and, and, and just seeing how the movement plays. I think it's going to be really exciting. Okay, number five to go next to the fireplace is um, called Woodstack. This is a lovely um, kind of nut brown that um, has some beautiful, really subtle tones in it that is going to be fantastic for doing um, trees and, you know, um, trees and animals and all sorts of beautiful things. I, I love this one. Next one along, what you need by your wood stack and your fireplace is a cup of hot coffee. So... <laughs> Hot coffee is a, a darker brown that coordinates really beautifully with um, wood stack and with fireplace that um, gives you, again, a lovely rich sort of chestnutty brown that is just so useful for everything. So that's that's a really fun one. Uh, the next one <laughs> is um, by the fireplace and the wood stack with your hot, hot cup of coffee you need a sleepy cat. <laughs> this orange has turned out so much better than I expected. I struggle with oranges. I don't know if you do, but I find oranges really difficult. They're either super crazy bright and just dominate everything, or they read as brown. So Katie and Pam and the team worked magic with this. This is such a perfect orange. I am thrilled. And it is, is named in honour of, um, <laughs> I had a 21-year-old 20, cat called um, Marcel Proust, the poet cat, who used to like to eat flowers. And he was my best friend for 21 years, and I miss him terribly. And so this is kind of in honour for my favourite cat. <laughs> okay, number eight is called Guilt. In this one, I was thinking of... Let me grab another example. When you get these lovely old books and they've got gilt embossing on the front or on the sides, this is a wonderful old trashy novel from the 19th century. I can talk about it if you're remotely interested. Um, <laughs> it's complete and utter trash. It's wonderful. Um, my idea when I was explaining this to, um, to Katie was those kind of colours and how you get a kind of glint in the sunlight and they've done that perfectly. It's a beautiful, pure, bright yellow 
with a little tone on tone variegation so when you stitch with it it looks like the sun's glinting off um, whatever you're stitching which is genius <laughs> anyway um, I love a bright happy yellow it's it's but again it's kind of soft and it's got a bit of age to it so it, it um, it's a lovely one number nine is um, candlestick I was thinking of the colors of brass here a kind of old gold and it's a beautiful beautiful piece um, beautiful color again it's sort of tone on tone variegation so it's quite subtle um, and it but it still reads as as gold as yellow when you stitch with it again yellows um, trying to get things to read as yellow can be quite difficult um, depending on what other colors you put next to them and everything and this one works perfectly so genius okay I need a sip of tea because I'm not used to talking this much <laughs> I am probably talking too fast and I will probably hopefully get better than at this but thank you for sticking with me <laughs> okay number 10 number 10 is called wolf named after my one of my very very favorite writers Virginia Woolf I um, back a long time ago I did a postgraduate degree in uh, in history and one of the women that I studied and wrote about for my thesis was Virginia Woolf and I think still my favorite novel is is Mrs. Dalloway um, which is one of the things that I studied and I wanted to evoke those colors of Bloomsbury those kind of jewel tones but kind of shabby <laughs> that I just love and um, this is a kind of very pale olive it's kind of in between green and yellow it's it's um, such a, a useful color for bridging other colors and bridging greens and adding highlights and everything I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with how it turned out and to be able to honor one of my favorite writers in in doing this is um it's a lovely thing so next one is what i just had a sip of chamomile tea <laughs> if hot coffee is not for you chamomile tea might be this is now my all-time favorite green i use this in in two of my designs that i just did for expo and love it it is so one of those universal greens that's just going to be good for everything again it's a kind of um, slightly olivey green I don't know if that's showing up there very well but you know we're doing our best <laughs> it's um, a bit like um, endive um, but I think it's got a bit more complexity to it it's um, yeah I, the best green <laughs> except for the next one and the next one but you know uh, the next one is a brighter green, more of a true sort of mid-green, and it's called conservatory. And I was thinking of ferns and, and things, you know, in, in beautiful pots next to where you're sitting and reading your favourite book. Um, this is an almost solid one again, so that's going to coordinate with the tone-on-tone -tone and variegated ones really well. And it's got a lovely um, brightness to it that um, I think is, is just gorgeous. So that's going to be a good one. Next one, I did a lot of greens. <laughs> I did a lot of greens because um, green's my favourite colour and when I'm designing and doing reproductions, I seem to have this enormous whack of greens and it never seems to be enough. So I did quite a few greens because in, in what I like to stitch, I like to stitch things of nature and flowers and foliage and things. Um, greens are what I, I think I use the most, so I wanted those to be a really comprehensive range that you can use for lots of things so this one um, is just a joy is called cloth bound so we've got leather bound we've got cloth bound there's two different types of um, coverings for books and this is a, a, a an almost emerald kind of green with a beautiful variegation of some of the other colors of greens going through it so it looks like the covers have aged on, on the side of a book I'll show you an example I was kind of thinking of here 
you know, when you get a book and it's this lovely colour on the front, but the spine's been sitting in the sun and <laughs> it's aged. And that's kind of what um, I was thinking of with this colour. And it turned out even more beautiful than I expected. I used this one in, in the library, the design that's coming out for Expo. And I think it's it's just beautiful. And I don't think I've seen one quite like this before. In fact, a lot of these colours are things that I haven't seen before. And that's sort of what I wanted to contribute. Some that are familiar that you can sub in and out with things you use all the time and some that bring something different. So that's cloth bound. <laughs> okay, number 14. We're halfway through. Whew. Is um, wing back. So a lovely wingback chair, which I don't know you can see that I'm sitting on right now, um, is a darker olive green that coordinates beautifully with the other greens, particularly with chamomile tea and with wolf. It gives you a beautiful colour story of kind of beautiful olives there. Um, I think of olives a lot in old books because some of my favourites, you know, come in kind of olivey greens in beautiful old tones. So they were really important to me to include and um, I find give a sense, sense of elegance and age to things that aren't quite as in your face as a lot of really, really bright greens. So um, I love those. I, I hope you enjoy them too. Okay, rearrange myself. Number 15 is something I've never seen before it's called tarnish and I was thinking of like your favorite old silver bowl or something that you've been meaning to polish for like you know three years now and haven't got around to it <laughs> it's got those wonderful tones of um, silver and gray um, but if you look really carefully there's some 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 almost like mauve and green as well and I'm thrilled to be playing with this one and just seeing what I can do and what you guys are going to do with this too because I think this is a really unique combination that I'm going to have fun with. I have a design coming up using the highly variegated ones to sort of show you what to do with them. And, yeah, I think this is going to be really fun. So that one's Tarnish. Okay. Oh, this is another enormous favourite of mine. Um... The idea on, of this one were the colours of an antique globe and Katie came up with the brilliant name of calling it Mercator, which is um, a type of representing the world in a, in a map form. Um, and it's the most beautiful combination of like aged turquoise and green and gold. And I just adore it. Not only does it look like better than candy in, <laughs> in the skein, it's so much fun to work with. Again, I use this um, in the design in the library for the little globe and it looks like I've used four colours and I've only used two. So it's there are wonderful things that you can do with these variegated ones that you just can't do with anything else in it, you know. Saves you time stopping and starting. So <laughs> that's always good. So, yeah, that one is called Mercator. Um, I may be pr pronouncing that wrong. I will check. But I, I just love this. I think this is beautiful. Okay, number 17. Again, when I was thinking of, you know, the, the, the comfort books I want around me in my fictional happy library is um, we needed to have Austin. Now, Austin is a beautiful, beautiful, um, very pale, smoky blue. Um, it made me think of, like, you know, Regency dresses and, and furnishings and things from one of those lovely Jane Austen, you know, um, reproductions. So <laughs> I don't have any Jane Austen books to show you, old ones, I'm afraid, because, you know, no one has them. <laughs> but um, this colour is so beautiful. Um, it's a f almost solid one, again, that contrasts really well with a lot of the others. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, soft blue that I will just be using all the time and you gotta love Jane Austen. Now <laughs> as much as we love all these these writers that I mentioned and there is another one coming up, uh, Virginia Woolf once famously said that anonymous was always a woman 
And so I called one anonymous because I think um, I like to do, I like to um, reproduce antique samplers as well. And a lot of them are anonymous. And I think a lot of the people that don't get recorded in history and a lot of them are, are women and, and marginalised people are, are left anonymous. And I, it's kind of my little way of honouring them in a, in a very, very small way. Um, this is a fabulous teal, which, um, oh, it packs a punch, this colour. It's so lovely. It's got some tone-on-tone -tone variegation, and it's it's just, it's, it's a delight. So, anonymous. <laughs> the next one is uh, called Morrison. Again, I was thinking of the books that have affected me greatly and the writers that I kind of wanted to acknowledge and I was thinking of Toni Morrison. I, I remember, again, this is a beautiful blue with lots of variegation in it. I was um, thinking, let me get my tea, of the books that, you know, I, I remember reading when I was young that really made a, a huge impact on me. And there's lots of them. I read a lot of books when I was young, a lot of books. But I have a very vivid memory of, of reading um, Beloved by Toni Morrison that I think should be mandatory reading for every single person on the earth. And it is one of the best examples of why I think reading fiction is so important because you have the privilege of seeing the world from someone else's point of view for a few hours while you're reading that book. And to me, that was an enormously important book that actually inspired a lot of my studies later on. I did a lot of um, studies in, in African-American history and reading Beloved sort of started that. Um, again, if you want more information on any of these things or you'd like me to talk about these things, leave a comment down there. I don't know what I'm doing yet, so we'll see where I go, but that's to honour. Um, Toni Morrison, who won the Nobel Prize and the Pulitzer Prize, and well-deservedly so. She was one of the most remarkable writers of the last century, so maybe that'll inspire you to read some. <laughs> okay, sip. Chamomile tea. Attempting to calm myself down. Okay, we're getting there. Number 20. <laughs> when I was putting together the brief of these colours, um... I was trying to describe this colour of what I wanted. And, you know, you've got pictures and things to show as well, but I was trying to show, you know, describe what I was thinking of. And <laughs> I was describing how in the 19th century, you know, um, ladies used to write scandalous novels in violet ink. And so Katie decided to call this one scandalous. <laughs> and this is such a beautiful, rich violet. And that's it, kind of dusky. It's, again, it's got a very slight tone-on-tone -tone variegation, and it's it's just beautiful. I love it. Again, purple can be a hard colour to use because some of them are super duper bright, um, and can take over a design a little bit. So having something that has this warmth and 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 duskiness to it, I think is is just lovely, and it coordinates with number twenty one which is called Parfum, which is a, uh, a beautiful lilac. And I was thinking of, you know, your favourite lilac perfume while you're sitting there reading your beautiful book. Okay. Number 22 takes a bit of explanation. When you've got your beautiful old book that you're reading, when you open up the pages, let me find a really good one for this. When you open up the pages, oh no, where's the good one? Oh, here it is. Get a lovely old book and it's full of these kind of spots along here. Let me see, they're usually well on the front covers, the end papers. I should have prepped this earlier. Here we go, on Valette. Those spots that you come there. That, that's called foxing. And when you're selling secondhand books, like I did in a dreadful job once, um, <laughs> um, you have to describe the book as having foxing. 
and to me it's not a bad thing it's a thing that oh this book has had life and age and it's been through hands and it's 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 a beautiful thing so we created a color called foxy um this is a really hard color to describe because Depending on what you put it next to, it seems to almost kind of morph. If you have it next to orange, it looks more orange. If you have it next to pink, it looks more pink. If you put it next to brown, it takes on a kind of brown tones. I love these shape-shifting colors. I, I, to me, they're just gold because you get so much value out of them, you know, in terms of using them in, in different kind of ways. So this one's number 22, Foxy. Um, okay, number 23 is Cashmere, which has some of the similar tones to Foxing, but with some cream added in there. I was thinking of a very, um, so it's a kind of pink with cream, but really soft and really kind of dusky. And I was thinking of like a really old favorite hand-me-down cashmere jumper that's full of holes, but you know, your grandma wore it and you know, you can't bear to get rid of it because it's your favorite. <laughs> That was my inspiration there. Oh, we're getting near the end. Number 24 is called Page Turner. This is my all-time favorite neutral now. And oh, I had a little talk with Katie and she's like, what? Will that not show up when, you know, like on, on your embroidery scene, won't, you know, that won't show up, will it? And I'm like, yeah, no, 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 that's, that's really useful. Let me tell you, you know. Um, not only does it show up well on beautiful coloured fabric, it's great for highlights. This is the kind of colour I use all the time. It's a really warm ecru with a little bit of extra colour um, put in there as well, like, you know, old lace or, you know, the, the beautiful pages of, of your favourite book that are still quite creamy on the outside but have got some lovely colour on the edges. So that's what I was thinking with that colour. Um, I can tell I'm just going to use that constantly. So <laughs> that's, that's a favourite of mine. Oh, here's another favourite. This one, they're all favourites. I mean, come on. This one's called Moth. And I was thinking of, of you look up pictures of moths and they have these amazing dusty kind of colours. And I don't know, if you have a lot of books, you end up with moths occasionally. So <laughs> I was just thinking of those lovely kind of warm, dusty browns, little bit of the ecru, and just tiny little tiny tinge of, of sort of orangey gold. And this one gives beautiful movement as well and is something I don't think I've seen before. It's, um, it's a joy. Getting near the end now. <sighs> okay, number 26 is called Cobweb which um, has a sort of brownie grey mixed with ecru and I use this on one of my other designs for Expo and it looks like a cobweb glinting in the sun. It's, it's just beautiful and I love these kind of neutrals because they add such texture and complexity to something that could otherwise be quite plain. So number 27 is called Nib which is a uh, darker grey with some lovely lighter tones in there as well. I was thinking of a pen nib of an old fountain pen. And again, these kind of warm greys I really like. Um, it's, it's a beautiful one. And last but not least is called Hearth. Um, this is the most fantastic soft black. And sneak peek, I'm using this on an on a antique reproduction I'm working on at the moment. Um, this is my favourite black now. It's got really, really subtle variegation in it and such warmth and softness. It's just divine. So that's the bookshelf collection. Um, an enormous thank you to Katie and Pam and the team at Cottage Garden Threads for asking me in the first place and for creating such beautiful things with, with my somewhat wacky idea. I'd also really like to acknowledge the, the contribution of um, Karen and Brendan from Fox and Rabbit Designs. They, um, these were designed specifically to work with their beautiful linen. So it's an all Australian kind of uh, project. And they also gave Katie a lot of help introducing her to the world of, of cross stitch, which um, they did a lot. They, from what I understand, um, did mainly embroidery beforehand. So, you know, um, 
we're bringing them into the cross stitch world and and it's lovely to see so many of you love them as much as i do so that's the bookshelf range um they are available for the very first time at expo for shops to buy so if you see them and like them ask your shop to get them in for you and in a couple of weeks they'll also be up on my etsy store and i'll be doing a special deal for um, those of you who buy from me there because um, I just really, I hope people love these as much as I do and I, I'd love to hear what you think too. So also please, you know, what do you think of the colours? Do you think you'll use them with um, patterns you already have or um, you're waiting for my new releases? <laughs> that sounds a bit stuck up. We won't say that. I'm really excited about my new releases, I have to say. I'm excited. I've been working really, really hard. Now, the first design you might have seen if you're up on Instagram is called In the Library. This is a um, based on the theme of, of the colours. I wanted to do a kind of introduction to the colours and to using them and to create that lovely, safe, comfort comfortable place that, you know, uh, we all dream of. And this uses 12 of the colours. You can buy thread packs um, specifically for this to give you a taster for, for the threads. And using them was just such a delight. This is done um, on 36 count baked clay by Fox and Rabbit. And I use one strand over two. And you get this much colour just from one strand. If you wanted to use a high count... Um, lower count fabric with two strands the colors just pop like mad it's absolutely beautiful but um personally i like stitching with one strand um it's just it's more fun for me and um it's also i feel kind of quicker somehow anyway and it's amazing the beautiful techniques that you can get through using these threads because <laughs> tell you what um Designing something that has books as a feature is actually really difficult to make it visually interesting because books themselves are rectangular blocks and they're not very interesting in a design. So using the threads and giving the using the variegation and the movement actually allows for a more visually interesting um, way of representing books and it also represents the, the different colours that you see on the spines and all sorts of things. I, um, again, this will be available at Expo um, for shops to order. So please ask your shop if you um, would like it. And it will be on my Etsy store in about two weeks from when this films um, in PDF and hardcover. Um, hardcover, hard copy. Um, all my patterns come in PDFs as well. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who find that easier and stitch from their, their device or you prefer it, or and it saves you shipping. So if you, you know, all of mine are on PDF as well. Um, I just loved stitching this. It was a bit of a last minute panic because like I said, I only got some of the, <laughs> the threads like a week ago, but it came together. It's one of those ones that just kind of came together. And I'm really pleased with how it turned out and I hope you enjoy it too. Oh, before I forget, this fits in a standard size frame as well. I can't remember, I think it's like a 9x9 nine nine or an 8x8, eight eight. I can't remember offhand, but it's on the pattern. Um, wherever possible, I like to use standard size frames because frame is expensive. If you can use a frame that you can buy in a shop for 5 or $10, use a frame, <laughs> you know. Um, I love to do that. So this, if you stitch it on 36 count or um, 18 count ADA, it will fit in this standard size. Um, which I hope is a helpful thing too because I think, you know, our work needs to be on the walls. It doesn't need to be in a box under the bed. No shade, no shame. We all have that. But if we can make it easier for them to actually be framed, I think that's a good thing. Anyway, yes, it has lots of motifs. It's got a globe and a telescope and lots of books and some old roses and my little cat. <laughs> and, you know... Some spectacles up there, some candles, some quills, a beautiful Tiffany lamp. Not based on where I have, but, you know, aspire to. Teacup up there. And I love this ivy border. 
with some little moss in between. I just adored stitching that. I think it came together really beautifully. I will also, as with all of my designs, I will have a blog post up that um, goes into details about the design and also some stitching tips for this because I have used the cottage garden threads in some different kind of ways to achieve the look that I've used in this, um, such as all the um, books that are lying horizontally, I stitched vertically. That way you get the variegation move across. So there's a few little things like that that, you know, um, you don't you certainly don't have to do, but um, I just thought if you were interested. Um, the pattern also comes with a DMC and Overdye conversion. And, um, but some of the um, features of the cottage garden threads you won't get with those. So it will still look beautiful, but it will look different. It will look more solid. So that's, you know, totally up to you, whatever you like and prefer. So this is in the library, which I'm really pleased about. I hadn't done a square design before. And... Um, yeah, like I said, trying to do something with books and, and a bookshelf was actually really, really tricky. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased with how it's come together. I, I hope you enjoyed stitching it as much as I do. Did do. Rambling. My second design that uses the um, new bookshelf range was <laughs> something that I came up with, I don't know, last year I don't know why oh I know what it was it was last year around Halloween time and I was watching all the Halloween designs come out now Halloween isn't really a thing in Australia it's not a traditional holiday for us there are some people that pick it up and if you have little kids and stuff I get that but it's simply not something that we do traditionally so and it's kind of difficult as well too because Halloween falls in our springtime and it would make more sense to me if we had it in the middle of the winter when everything's dark and spooky, but to have it in spring <laughs> feels very strange. So I was trying to think of, oh, you know, how can I do Halloween but that's kind of like springtime? So <laughs> my solution was to do Australian spiders. This is just one of three in this design. Australian spiders but with flowers because <laughs> I'm trying to make it springtime. This is, oh man, this is hard to show. I've got to work on my floss tube showing skills because it's harder than it looks, man. This is the red back Piscornu. A red back is one of our infamous Australian spiders. And I feel like I'm playing into Australian stereotypes here, but everyone goes, oh, everything's going to kill you. We don't have bears. Like, yeah, we have spiders. They generally leave you alone. We don't have bears, so, you know, I beg to differ. I think, you know, you guys in the U.S. have some really scary animals too and other places in the world. Man, you've all got scary animals. Maybe not quite so many, but, you know, you have them. Anyway, the red back is actually a really tiny little spider, so this is a quite misleading <laughs> impression. Um, it's a tiny little thing. I've only ever seen one once. Um, it's not like they're roaming the streets. <laughs> um, this and all, this is from a, a, a pattern that I'll get to in a moment. All of these are stitched on 36 count hog bristle by, um, Fox and Rabbit, which is a beautiful, deep, warm gold, um, which was really lovely to work on. It shows the, the colours of the cottage garden threads beautifully. So I created a kind of web. I don't know if you can see the cobweb as you use it. As you can see, it kind of looks like the sun glinting on the cobweb. Um, I also finished this in a kind of different way. Rather than using a button, I used some of the leftover threads from stitching it and just created a little, little knot and a little tassel. I will have a blog post up. I don't know if I finished my thought there before. I will have a blog post up on this as well with finishing instructions and everything. I like to save paper in my um, patterns so I put the finishing instructions and tips and those kind of things up on my blog. Um, it just means we're, we're using less papers which to me is a good thing. So it's a Biscornu. I love Biscornu. If you haven't tried one before 
they're really a lot easier than, than they look. Um, putting it together is actually really not difficult. Um, and it's such fun taking this 2D thing and turning it into this amazing 3D creation. Um, this is a quick and easy stitch. Um, I was hoping it would make you smile. <laughs> to coordinate with that, and that gives, you, gives them the name as well. My response to spiders generally is that they have too many legs. <laughs> this is the uh, Huntsman Needlebook. Now, Huntsman are a different spider. Like, redbacks are tiny. They stay where they are. They don't come after you. A Huntsman, on the other hand, are a whole other story. They're actually not poisonous. Redbacks, poisonous. Tend to leave you alone. I don't think anyone dies from them anymore. They've got anti-venine sort of thing. Huntsmen, though, can be as big as your hand. Like, no kidding. They are not poisonous. They're just terrifying. <laughs> um, they move really fast. And I have spent more than one night on the couch because there's been a huntsman in my room. And you can't go to sleep if you think huntsman's going to fall on your face. So, <laughs> although they are not poisonous, they're really scary. And you don't know where they're going to go. They move really fast. And so you think they're going to go that way. And you think, oh, I can get out of the room before it's fallen on me. Um, <laughs> and it comes straight for you. So my response is it has too many legs. I love a needle book. I use them all the time. Um, I just think it's such a nice way to respect your stitching. And this is just very simply put together um, with a little bit of felt in the middle for your needles. Um, just use some coordinating fabric on the back and some of my silk sari ribbon that I love to use as the ties. This is a really quick and easy stitch. Um, again, using colours from the thread that uses chamomile tea and candlestick and hot coffee and cobweb and leather bound. And we've got some half for the red backs. And to coordinate with that, I made the itsy bitsy scissor fob. It's just got a tiny little, tiny little, tiny, you can make it bigger than that if you want, but a tiny little web and spider on it to coordinate with your lovely stitching set. Now, I had such fun putting these together. Um, and if you were going to make a, a gift for another stitcher, this would be, I think, lovely. Not one who's an arachnophobe, maybe, but I think it's a lovely thing. And I have a little, little surprise about that at the end, if I remember. That pattern is called Too Many Legs because, again, it's my response to spiders. New releases still coming. The next one is also with cottage garden threads, but with a palette. This is a um, a little pin pillow called Just Turning, which celebrates that moment when the autumn leaves just start to turn. This is done in collaboration with cottage garden threads and with I think about twenty five other designers. Used exactly the same palette to. Um, create the designs and gosh it's amazing to see what everybody does with the same things it's so fascinating it's just been an absolute joy to watch and this is my little contribution this is done um, using one strand over two on 36 count vintage by number 12 stitch co on Etsy um, hi Nicole <laughs> who um, does beautiful hand dyed fabric and this is a really quick and easy stitch that does use a little bit of back stitch and a little bit of satin stitch as well. And what I've actually done is tweeted two of the um, two of the colours together. So you load it on your needle with one strand of each colour um, to get some of the satin stitch kind of effects. That's a way of, again, Instructions will be up on my blog. That's a way of, if you mix one of the highly variegated colours and one of the less variegated ones and tweed them together, it kind of tones down the variegation a little bit and makes it less harsh. So not that, not that it's harsh, but you know what I mean. It makes it a little softer. So in this one for the sun, 
I used dandelion and terracotta tweeted together, which made a slightly softer than, than the original terracotta. And for the little flower sort of hills underneath there, I use one strand of golden gully and one of spruce, which is a way again of um, adding to the variegation and, and allowing the movement, but still keeping it kind of green, if that makes sense. And I also used um, three strands of the dandelion for the finishing. I just plaited that together, made a bow and sewed it on. And um, it's just a nice way of using the, the threads that you have left over for uh, your finishing. Now, yes, this is called Just Turning. It's part of the Autumn Garden Sow um, that I believe is being run by Abby Topknot Stitcher at Topknot Stitcher Shop. Oh, that's hard to say, Abby. <laughs> and um, she's selling thread packs and a lot of the patterns as well. The patterns can also be found from your local needle, needlework store, who I think can get the threads from her as well. Ask your needlework store. They'll know what's going on. Failing that, go ask Abby. She's fabulous. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is my little autumn garden contribution. Now, next we come to my antique reproductions. Um, I love to do reproductions. Um, for me as a designer, I feel like I'm teaching myself to design better by reproducing the amazing work of people in the past. And I have a lot to say about that in other videos and, and things, but you know, we'll um, save that for another day when I'm babbling less and sleep deprived less. <laughs> this is a big piece well, big for me, that I've called, there we go, Afternoon in the Garden. Uh, I love stitching this. Like, it gave me some headaches. Don't get me wrong. You'll be fine. I had the headaches for you. <laughs> um, I absolutely love stitching this. I'm not normally a house stitcher. Um, I know a lot of people love to stitch houses, and that's their thing, and it makes them feel comfortable, and it's cosy, and I get that. I don't have that same association and I prefer to stitch. I don't know, I'm, houses are just not my thing. I love this house though. I love this house. And when I saw this sampler, I'll show you the antique in a minute. Um, the flowers and the unusual color palette and the little details. Here's this lady. I can't work out whether this is a parasol or one of those big like threshing rake things. Don't know. There's a little rooster there. That sort of weird unshapen mass, I think, is meant to be a cow lying down, but happy to take suggestions. Oh, she's got, like, afternoon tea with drinks laid out under the willow. There's a little dog hiding under there. I just love that. I just love that. Now, doing these greens was a bit of a challenge. We'll get to that in a minute. But I thought this was just such an unusual piece and... I just, I just fell in love with it. Uh, it is stitched using a combination of Weeks Gentle Arts and Classic Colourworks. Um, I've got a DMC conversion, of course, and it's stitched on 40 count Week T by Jay's X Stitch, also on Etsy. Um, Jay uses natural dyes, and I just love, I love her fabric. Hi, Jay. <laughs> um, she does absolutely beautiful fabric. That's just a joy to stitch on. And this is a really soft, um, really soft, warm, neutral that's slightly yellow. Um, yeah, this is this was a joy. Um, I think I've said that 12 times, but let me stop. I don't know where this is from. I have been trying to work it out um, with only initials and a date. Who knows? I get a European vibe off this. It doesn't feel like an American sampler to me at all. It, the color palette's different. Um, I kind of get a French vibe because of the use of the flowers so much, but French samplers, I'm not an exam I'm not an expert, but from what I know, they don't tend to have houses all that much. So I don't know. I've been trying to work out where, what kind of house this might be and where that might reference. So if anyone has any ideas, please let me know. The other clue is that there is this weird letter right at the end of the alphabet here. 
that is like an S and a T superimposed on top of each other. I don't know if we can see that. Just there. I have been trying to research that letter. Um, the closest thing I can think of is, is there is a letter in German that's kind of um, represents a double S, but it's not written like that, and I haven't been able to find if it was historically written by that, like that. So I'm thinking it's a kind of, this one isn't secured very well in the frame just yet, so getting ready for Expo Man, it's <laughs> shortcuts. Um, yeah, I haven't been able to narrow down that letter because I'm thinking that's a really good clue to where this sampler came from. I am wondering, I mean, again, I think it's European. I'm wondering whether it's like France but bordering somewhere else, you know, one of those, uh, whether this is like a dialect or something that comes from a, from a dialect. I don't know. I have been trying to research, but... It's not my area of expertise, and I would love if we have any language experts, historical language experts out there, please let me know. I would be fascinated to know what you think. And just in general, too, um, where do you think this is from? I, I would love to, to you know, hear your ideas and, and gain from your expertise as well because um, it's a bit of a mystery. But I, it's so calm and... Um, really beautiful. So I, I hope you enjoy stitching this one. Um, I reproduced it very faithfully, um, which let me tell you getting these greens was was a challenge. I must have used every green in existence <laughs> to trial to get this kind of smooth gradient in there. And yeah, it was, it um, took a lot of unpicking, but I'm really pleased with how it came out. My only suggestion for doing this, one of the greens that I used was Gentle Arts uh, Baby Spinach, but a recent 2022 dye lot. Older Baby Spinach that I have in my stash is a completely different colour. Now, I'm going to have more information and pictures of this up on my blog. I didn't want to have to do that, say, so, you know, use a certain dye lot but it was literally the only one I could get to work. Um, I don't have every green. I don't have a needlework store nearby, so you might be able to find something else better. My only suggestion is if you have got the darker green, swap that around with the grape arbor and make the, make the darker baby spinach the darker green in the palette. I'll write this up on the blog when it makes more sense when I've had some sleep. It's... um. Yeah, I thought it was a lovely piece that um, was really unusual and really, really, really fun to stitch. And not so massive that you've kind of got a tablecloth. Love a tablecloth, but, you know, it's not huge. Let me show you the, the antique. Now, it's a little battered. <laughs> um, if you hold it up to the light, it's full of holes. Um, it appears it's got a lot of colour run on down here. It appears somebody tried to wash it at some point. Public service announcement. Don't try to wash your antique samplers. Please. Don't do it. <sighs> so the only thing I didn't reproduce in uh, my reproduction at the bottom of... Oh, i got to get at the bottom of the house, there's some colour bleed and it's almost kind of blue at the very bottom of the house. I did try a bunch of colours just to see whether we could reproduce that and it just didn't look right and it just kind of looked kind of weird and I couldn't get the gradient to it. So I've just um, stitched that in whatever colour I used for the, <laughs> for the body of the house. I can't remember. It's like parchment or one of the one of them it'll be on the pattern um so that's the only difference that i use now for the for the sampler purists that like to know about what um, what it was stitched on and what it's used this appears to be wool fabric it's really really scratchy um which is quite unusual and it appears to be stitched in silk there's a picture of the back if you're interested in the back it's got a little bit more color but it's um, 
held up pretty well considering. That's the front. And it's uh, very slightly smaller than 40 count. Um, I don't stitch on anything higher than 40 count because I like to see. Um, if you want to stitch it smaller, by all means, go for it. This would be lovely done in silk. Um, I expect somebody will do a silk conversion and um, I think that would be absolutely beautiful. I stitched it um, on 40 count because that gave the, uh, the density of the colours. I generally, again, prefer um, 36 count. But it, uh, you didn't get the density of the colours. So I, if you don't want to use 40 count, I would recommend using 28 or 32, but using two strands. And that way you'll get the richness of the colours as well. Um, but you do you. Um, I'm not a purist with samplers. Um, I love to reproduce them and I do my, my very best to reproduce them as, as faithfully as possible. But I love it when people change it and make it their own. I mean, that's what the original stitches did. They took bits from their mum's sampler or their sister's sampler or their teacher's sampler and combined it into something that they made their own. So I love it when people make their own. If I was stitching this for myself and not for a model, I would have put my own initials in there and the date. And I think that would be a lovely thing to do. So just an idea. Afternoon in the garden. I... Um, I hope you love it. Next one. <sighs> and my bunnies. I love my bunnies. They're so cute. This I call twitching noses because, you know, they just look like they're out there watching and, and ready to run. This is a reproduction of this little piece that was originally done in Petit Point. And I wasn't going to stitch that, and I wasn't going to make you stitch that. So <laughs> I've um, stitched it two over two on 32 count flax. Um, again, to get the richness of the colours, because this was done, you know, on such a fine scale, you get that real denseness of colours. I would have loved to get an oval frame for this one, actually, but I just, just couldn't find one. Now, me being me... I often stitch things two, sometimes even three times to get them exactly how I want them. And I stitched this beforehand using one strand on 36 count. Let me get this close. That tones down the colour slightly and gives a more aged look. So if that's your preference, do that too. Um, I ended up going with the 32 count on the model because again this fits in a standard size frame and I love being able to do that because that means you can get it on your wall straight away. Um, this is actually a really quite quick and fun little stitch and I just love these um, animal pieces. I, I think they're they're really enjoyable and yeah it's, it's really fun. So that's twitching noses. And last but not least is the bird. This is Among the Roses. Oh, I don't have the don't have the original with me. I'll there'll be pictures um, up on my blog as usual. When I released um, Mary Barton's work last year, I can tell you a secret. I just put that one in thinking, oh, everyone's gonna think that one's a bit weird. I don't know if they'll like it. That was the one everybody loved. So <laughs> you can never pick. Um, I'm i I've been so thrilled to see you know, so many people stitch that and, and to be able to do something a bit different. I love these old needlepoint pieces. Um, you know, these Victorian sort of Berlin work needlepoint pieces. I just love. Um, and it's something different that we can do reproductions with. So I, I have, I have a little bit of a stash of them that I've been collecting for a while because I love them so much. And now I know that you guys love them so much too. We can, um, I think we might be working on a flock. Anyway, this is number two. Um, I called it Amongst the Roses because I loved these, these roses here that have this really unusual kind of like brown 
it's I think it's dirt road I ended up using um, that almost look like they're um, curling and fading on on these leaves I think it's an, such an unusual choice that as a designer I would not have made so again I this is why I like to do reproductions because I learned by by doing them now this one is is faithfully reproduced I, as except for one thing that I'll get to in a moment um, this is again two over two on 32 count soft ivory by Zweigart it would look beautiful on a bunch of hand dyed naturals but I wanted to do some that are on um, solids as well so you can see what they look like so yes um, again this is a standard size frame so you usually can't do that with reproductions because you've got to go with what they are but this one fit I was really really excited now as I mentioned I did I I do a lot of work when I do these reproductions because you want to get them as exact as possible um, that's the general idea of, a, of you know doing a reproduction is that you are passing something on that you know not everyone has access to so you're passing it on to make to make it accessible for everyone to have in their homes now I had to make a bit of an executive decision with this one because this color here of the back and the breast of the bird in the original was more orange now told you before I had problems with oranges I tried every single orange I could get my hand on and none of them worked they were all too bright they all took over the whole thing and I struggled and I got more oranges <laughs> I tried browns I tried everything that I could to try and reproduce the original as much as possible in the end I ended up going with a slightly pinker tone that fits the tone better and it represents the tone of the original a little bit better even though the colour is slightly different. That's a bit of a risk. That's not something I, I, that perhaps all people who do reproductions with but it was the best solution to me because it just wasn't working. All you saw was the orange there and you lost the the harmony of the piece so um, again I'll put up pictures on the blog so you can see if anybody finds oranges that work go for it would love to hear your solution because I I stitched and ripped that out I don't know how many times and that was the solution I was happy with to me it, it's coherent it works really well together but I'd love to know what you think is that is that breaking the rules I don't know but this is among the roses um, it's a bit bigger than Mary Barton but they look beautiful together and it looks good with the rabbits too um, <laughs> I hope you enjoy stitching this as much as you did Mary Barton for those of you who who told me how much you love stitching it and yeah I can't wait to see to see what you do <sighs> expo is tomorrow at one o'clock in the morning so <laughs> I'm gonna run now because I have about six million things to do that I need to do before Expo thank you for indulging me thank you for letting me share my love of, of needlework with you guys I, I hope you find something here that inspires you and please tag me on on Instagram if you're there with um, what you're doing and what you're stitching and which patterns you like because um, it, it really fills my heart to see um, what you guys do if this goes okay I will do it again <laughs> um, I would love to sort of talk a little bit more about my older designs and perhaps a bit of a better introduction of me and where I come from and how I ended up doing this and yeah if that's something you're interested in please let me know um, I would also like to announce a little competition as I'm starting out this YouTube channel completely new um, I would like to give away a, um, a pattern a set of threads all you need to stitch too many legs um, when we hit 500 subscribers tell your friends 
Um, and I will also give you a finishing pack of all the finishing that I used to make this piece. That's not something I'm selling. It's from my personal stash. So um, please subscribe. Um, please leave a comment down the bottom, you know, all that stuff. But it does help other people find um, the channel. And, yeah, when we hit 500, I'll do a random thingy and we'll send that off. And that may not be all. I, I have the feeling we might be doing competitions a fair bit. So, anyway, thank you so much for spending some time with me. I hope I didn't talk too fast. I hope my Australian accent isn't too thick for those of you overseas. I think I didn't swear, which as an Australian is quite an achievement, let me tell you, because swearing's really normal down here. Um, that's it. I will um, see you after Expo when, um, yeah, things are flying on their way to you guys. I really hope you enjoy them, and thanks so much for spending time with me. See you soon.